Good evening, QFAM, and welcome back to Las Vegas, Nevada. It is quite a sizzler this week, and it's not just because the temps are over 100. We are here at Black Hat, the largest cybersecurity conference in the world, and our guests have just been action-packed. Super excited to break it all down for you in our closing analyst segment. My name is Savannah Peterson, joined here with John Furrier and one of our favorite VIP Cube guests. Zias, how are you doing, man? Great. And it is the temperature outside that's making it sizzle. It's yeah. really, <laughs> it is, it is hot out there. Yeah. 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 I'd say turn the heat lamps off. Yeah. 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 You know, the inferno. The inferno <laughs> here is just, it's, it's real. Zias, yeah. you've been coming to this show for a while. You've got legs and depth in cybersecurity. What does this show mean every year? Uh, well, it's a, you know, the thing I like about the show is it's more a practitioner show. When you go to RSA, that's, you know, it's turned largely into a marketing event. You know, there's a lot of vendors talking to vendors. Uh, Black Hat's got a lot of security pros here to learn about how to protect their companies, what's, what's the latest and greatest coming. Most of the keynotes are very technically focused as well. So to me, this is the security show for security people, where, again, you can look at some of the other ones as maybe more the security show for marketing people. I think that's a really. Yeah. I think well, that's actually a really yeah. a, a, a unique lens, and I think it's reflected in the community as well as in the guests. Even the vibe, it's cash. Yeah. It's, it's integrated. It's collaborative. I think it's cool. Yeah. No. Uh, the people I've talked are very excited to be here. I mean, uh, you know, the last earlier this, or I guess late last month, we had a couple of events happen that raised the bar on I don't cyber know what resiliency you're and about. digital security <laughs> and things like that. So, uh, in fact, uh, that couldn't have been better planned. Uh, you know, to have people come out here and now uh, take another look at things. And for, for you know, for once, um, uh, while AI will be, you know, the lead, I guess, uh, digital resilience and cyber resilience is, is right up there now. And I think, you know, this, the thing totally that with CrowdStrike just gave that another shot in the arm. And it's something I think that we'd forgotten about, right? You, you have to be resilient in your infrastructure in order to protect yourself and be up and running all the time. All this AI stuff is great, but if your infrastructure is not up and running and ready, None of that AI stuff does you any good. Well, and, and the adoption of AI, which we're seeing ubiquitously across the market, means that there's that same tool in the hands of nefarious actors, which changes the whole ballgame. Yeah, well, the other side of that, too, is AI is all data-driven, right? And so now if you don't have access to your data, then you can't run your AI algorithms, and more and more companies are trying to... In fact, the biggest hindrance to AI today is what to do with data. Uh, I've, I, about a year ago, I think, uh, companies were trying to consolidate their data you know, into one big database or data lake somewhere, then they realize, well, that's not really practical, <laughs> right? I can't keep copying my data, moving it everywhere, so can we keep it at rest and then be able to apply AI to that? I think the answer is somewhere in the middle, but uh, you know, to me, that's been the biggest barrier. But if I leave too much data in too many places, now I gotta think about how to protect them. And it's interesting that when you look at all the AI for whatever, networking, collab, whatever that you've seen, AI for security has been out there, but there hasn't been a lot of talk about security for AI, right? How I secure my data, how I secure my AI, and I think that in some ways, that's been a bit of a missing piece because I think it's hard to do and nobody's really figured out how to do that yet. Yeah. I think Although a, there's a lot of startups trying to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's a really great point, and I think you know the last two years have changed the need for that solution to arise yeah. and the velocity at which we deliver those. Well, solutions. once we once we roll it into production, right. right? Certainly, and I think right now we're still in a, a big kicking the tires phase with AI. Uh, if you just look at the ecosystem of who winning, like people are buying lots and lots of GPU enabled servers, but the rest of the ecosystem, network, the storage, things like that have lagged behind. And to me, they're trialing things, but they're not building out their full AI stacks yet. But once they do that, then security has to come. And one of the cautions I think I have for the industry is when you think of security, typically the security of stuff comes a couple of years after the stuff, right? We roll out IoT and they go, oh, I gotta secure this, right? We roll out mobile devices and we go, oh, I gotta secure oh, this. Oh, Edge is a liability. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, but I think with AI, I don't, I don't think you can afford that lag. I think that's gotta be part of that deployment. And, and so I, uh, I do think you'll see that be a big part of the show here. Oh, it's been a big part of our conversations yeah. here today. And, and, and the attention to your earlier points is on, uh, because of the crowd's great incident, there's been all eyes on cybersecurity yeah. now all of yeah. a sudden because so many people were impacted. I mean, there were millions of people bricked. And that's an insane experience for everybody. So I, I almost feel that this show is timed at a really unique market moment yeah. for us to be able to have these conversations. And those conversations are now more relevant than ever, not just to the CISO or the decision maker in the organization, but to these dev teams, to the end user, to everyone who's in 
involved, which is super cool. John, who was your favorite guest so far today? We've well, had some well, bangers. Well, first of all, I want to counter what G has said about RSA. I don't think RSA is just a marketing show. I think they do a lot of business conversation, more business transformation, and it is bigger, so it yeah. becomes a marketing show, uh, which is why we like it. it but it's got a business spin. This show, you're right, I mean, I would agree. This is technical, but it's also, CISOs are here too with their teams. Yes. And, and what I like about this show is that um, it's not as posturing as the business side, because the business side, they talk about different issues. I think that's what you know, how do you budget, how, what's the business transformation journey, all that stuff they talk about. But here, like you pointed out, it's, it's authentically technical, and they're talking about real things, like red team, blue teams, how do we do it? Yeah. What's this uh, cyber resilience look like? We had the NYSC, business CISO on. And so those are much meatier conversations, and it doesn't get the fanfare in the broader market, um, but it does here. Um, and I think, you know, my, my favorite conversation here is, the focus on the product sprawl, the consolidation um, conversation around that debate. And then two, what we're seeing with the data platform we just had in, in Superstudio, we've been tracking this, you've you commented many times on theCUBE. We are seeing, first time in my life, a significant, um, from a scope standpoint, comprehensive re-engineering of the enterprise platform. Um, and I haven't seen this kind of level of, uh, of attitude, conversations, and thinking around this in, uh, since it was going the other way from mainframes into kind of cool into network. Yeah. And, and it's not like an easy thing to do. It's like, it's not IT as a department or the classic, there's a business. It is absolute end-to-end -end infrastructure like plumbing and like concrete. So I think, you know, this has never happened before I've seen. So I think security has to be baked in from day one. So this industry is not only fighting the threats and then dealing the resilience, they got to actually zoom out and go, okay, how do I build out an infrastructure, so platform engineering's in there, you got physical security, you got data security. I mean, right now there's 13 categories just in InfoSec. Yeah. I mean, that's just the categories of siloed solutions. So I think the solution sprawl, the number of vendors, number of solutions, that has to be addressed, it either gets vaporized or it gets abstracted away with, with another layer. So again, that's just, this yeah, is kind of fun. The, 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 yeah. data, the data you brought up in the last segment too about companies expanding their security footprint which is counter to consolidation, both can be true. And I think it's, it's how you think about it. When you think about how consolidation occurs in security, you commoditize the, the legacy or you know, the commodity. So if you think about what a next gen firewall is, it's a bunch of standardized things, IPS, firewall, things like that, that have been standardized into one box, right? Consolidated into one box. SSE consolidated SWIG and CASB and ZTNA and things like that. But I think to your point, our infrastructure has gotten so much more broad, the attack surface has gotten so much bigger that all these new areas that we're adding on aren't ready for consolidation yet, yeah. right? And so I think we are simulta simultaneously seeing people consolidate through the use of SSE, but also an, an XDR, but then also yeah. expanding their uh, security footprint for things like AI security and um, uh, you know, reputation protection, like you talked about, yeah. one of your guests talked about, things like that. So there's a bunch of new security categories coming as well. It's interesting too, Savannah, we had uh, Ryan Bear from uh, ICE, who oversees all the security. The, the, the trend to building their own, build versus buy. So if you look at like say, application security, you mentioned firewalls, mm -hmm. endpoint. You got endpoint, application, they're all kind of blending. So his view is, we're going to vertically integrate in, on site and look for best of breed specific vendors versus people jumping around, I can do all three of things for you. That's interesting, Zias, and, and again, I don't know how that plays out because I, I just don't know how, every infrastructure is different. It's not like you can just see Yeah, this, know, like, this, the tech goes through waves though, right? We, uh, as you mentioned, we add mainframes, and then we moved into this big open system area, then we consolidated it down to platforms. You think about things like all the big enterprise apps at one time, SAP, Oracle, they were all these vertically integrated stacks then companies go, I don't want to buy a vertically integrated stack, I want this open. Right. Then they realize they can't put this stuff together, and so you look at the AI stacks, and I'll be more vertically integrated. There will come a period of time yeah. when we have better best practices, and we'll want to take that and break that out again, and then we'll, we'll reconsolidate Well, the question that. is, do they buy a vertically integrated stack, or they build their own, and they're a vendor to themselves? I mean, just, it's interesting, I'm not sure how that's going to play out. Not everyone can build their own. Right? No, no, well, it's like kind of like we've got Dell's yeah. AI factory. You see a lot of companies trying to come with that full solution yeah. to be that AI partner, whether it's full yeah. stack. Or I think the, the leading companies where tech really is that difference, uh, like at the New York Stock Exchange, they're going to build their own. For most companies, though, they they want to 
take all that tweaking and tuning time out of it. You buy these, you build these vertically integrated systems. Remember even with mm -hmm. computer infrastructure, the early days of VCE, yeah. right? Companies would say it would save months and months of time, yeah. but then eventually we got good at it and then we could take it and disaggregate it. So we love this pendulum of disaggregate yeah. and then reintegrate, right? Because- And meanwhile, the threats are coming in and yeah. all the time. It's like, <laughs> yeah. 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 never been faster. But that's where velocity. security consolidation will happen again. It'll just be, now, where the industry has been challenged is, while I mentioned like, think NG firewall, XDR, cloud security, right? Those are all separate platforms. Companies aren't going to one vendor for all of those, right? Or very rare they do. And so now you're having to manage multiple platforms and multiple vendors. Yeah. And that creates a problem I think that security pros haven't had before. Yeah. You know, one of the things, Savannah, I always kind of keep in the back of my head is when you have these waves, there's always something that no one's talking about that comes out of left field or, or something th people mm -hmm. think is either stupid or irrelevant and becomes a thing. And, and every single inflection point is always that moment. Even the web was laughed at in early days. And you think about the role of silicon and coding down closer to the silicon, uh, more kernel developers, we've been talking about mm -hmm. that on, on theCUBE recently. And then, and then with all this data train, you mentioned it earlier, the data model layer, I think data will, will force some new things that we don't yet know. And this is what I keep my eye out for. And see, so I'd love to get your thoughts on you know, the things that might, that could be out of left field, that could change the game. Um, and that's something that, you know, you're starting to see the, the signs that it's boiling up, the open data formats. You're seeing like the cataloging, data being separated from databases and, and more in the catalogs to let data be free. We had Bruno on, yeah. former founder of Sumo Logic, now he's got Bedrock Security. He had a great uh, interview on mm -hmm. this piece. So I think there's some stuff um, evolving from that's coming in from the gen AI, whether it's transformer technology or how it treats data, neural nets, and you know, using all kinds of techniques to get better recommendation engines. Hey, don't push that update, CrowdStrike. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> don't hit the button. I mean, you know, I mean, you don't know. If they I mean, could pull that one back. But, yeah. well, I mean, this is the thing. What is there in your mind some left field things that could happen, come out of left field? Uh, well, I guess if they're in my mind, they probably wouldn't be left field, but uh, that yeah. Would, uh, <laughs> that, that, would look, that would seem crazy today, that would kind of change the color of the industry. Um, yeah, you know, I do think when you look at what's, what, what happened with CrowdStrike and all the, the things VMware customers are thinking now because of Broadcom locking them down, this whole concept of data freedom, like is there a way to unlock my data from the underlying platforms that they've been locked into for so long? Uh, I, I remember talking to Dave Vellante about this at VMworld last year that the cost of moving off of VMworld is so high that Broadcom can do whatever they want from a licensing perspective and they're locked in. So what if there was a way to actually create better data portability and so if I want to move from you know, VMware to AHV or something like that, Nutanix, I can do that or um, even if you look at a lot of the you know, Slack and Microsoft Teams tools, people say they can't move off because their data is locked in. Right, and so I, I think the uh, data freedom is something, to, a, a space to watch and how we were able to actually create better portability. The, the CrowdStrike example is great. I bet you Delta would have loved to be able to take their data and move it somewhere else to a different platform, right? Because, Especially like that. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. We, we tie ourselves into these single vendor solutions so much and um, leave ourselves with no options if something like that happens. Then you see you know, Delta reported 500 million in losses or something like that, that's, yeah. that's crazy, right, yeah. so. And that's immediate losses. In fact, that's I, not even brand debt. Yeah, in fact, forward. I think that's where, uh, they lost my golf clubs, by the way, so I was pretty upset about that, but that's, that's another story. But, <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, yeah. Delta, get it together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I, but uh, this is where I think customers should be demanding that the vendors provide some path out from their platform if they want to move. If you really think your product's the best, give your customers the option to move off instead of locking them in. All right. I, I think that's a really good point though. And one of the things that was really interesting that, that uh, Ryan brought up as Andrew on our production team had a great question as he was exiting the room today was you know how do, how do these companies work together? How do you bring two groups together or all these different bodies? And he brought up something that was cool. He said, it doesn't matter if we're direct competitors in cybersecurity, we all talk to each other because we've yeah. all got to figure out how to handle some of these solutions. And I think that's really compelling. That's kind of the opposite of say, Silicon Valley behind closed doors, whisper, whisper yeah. culture. It's a much more a build in public, solve in public and make make not just our companies or our customers more secure, but even per our conversation we were having with Sherrod at Microsoft earlier today, make our nation more secure, make our national secrets more secure. 
and yeah. It's well, that's the lip service from the vendors, and I hope they're doing that. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, I think um, uh, it is necessary because the bad guys all share info, right? And it's right. A, it's a little bit of fight fire with fire, right? So if you've got every threat actor out there willing to share information, and you've got all the vendors keeping all their stuff proprietary and to themselves, it's a losing battle, right? right. And uh, especially now with AI being used, the quality of data and the size of your data set matters, right? And so uh, I, I do hope the vendors take that to heart and they actually do that and they're not just giving out, you know. I, I do think there should be better standardization even and things like that. You look at, um, uh, you know, we talked this a little bit, this RSA, right? This whole concept of vendors reporting their own vulnerabilities. Some do it, some, some do it better than others. Well, why isn't that all standardized, right? Why is it up to customers to report things instead of the vendors? Some like it, some don't. So I have some yeah. insight there, and I can't reveal my sources, but a little birdie told me this week that the National Institute of Standards and Testing is about to draw up ex very new guidelines that are more intense than RSA's guidelines and a lot of things to do precisely that yeah. and to get folks on the same page, particularly at the federal level and, and across some of these larger enterprises and, and monoliths that operate in our space. So I, I think you're spot on there, and I think we're quite literally going to be talking about this next week or the week after and how it affects the market. So we'll have to have you on the show. To yeah, well, that. That, to me, that's a necessary part of it. I know the media loves to pick on the vendors, the, the big vendors with that report a lot of vulnerabilities, but I'd, I, I, you know, as a, as a practitioner, I would much rather see that than the other way. Right, where they're not reporting. Well, so. it's kind of like getting your blood work done. You know, you want to know what you need to work on. Yeah. yeah and, and, and you want to have, have awareness of that, not when you're in a moment of crisis having yeah. a crowd strike meltdown, but you're having a, a proper just day-to-day, -day, how can we be more mindful of this and, and lower our cholesterol or our collective yeah. digital risk. But if they do share data and they are more interoperable, then you have more eyes looking at them, those those things, and perhaps you could have one vendor helping another vendor out, right? And 100%. Yeah, and uh, you don't see that very often today. And uh, I, you know, it is very competitive out there, but I think the security industry is one where everyone win needs to win in order for it to work. Yes, I thought you know, one of my classic questions for guests is, is what do you hope you can say this time next year when we're back sitting here? And something that I really loved coming out of the Armist team earlier, Nadir there this afternoon, was saying he hopes that nothing horrible happens in this industry, some huge AI hack or breach or something that goes down that then lowers the water level of the whole industry because of its severity. And I thought that was a really astute situation, basically saying hopefully we all continue to rise together, the water level rises up versus, versus kind of this collective downward spiral. I thought that was a really interesting I mean, that's, insight. I mean, that's the key message I've been hearing here. It's like, you know, bring order to the chaos, but enhance the security outcomes so that it doesn't yeah. Yeah, like, I'm fail. actually surprised we haven't had, uh, you know, a, a, a big AI breach yet. Um, I, I agree you with know, you. And probably because most companies haven't rolled this into production. I think it's still an uh, R&D. Yeah. I think but, that's kind of the... But, but I'm expecting, you know, one sometime. Um, and, you know, the, even all, all the, the, the deep fake videos and voice calls you're seeing today are getting right. so much easier to do. You know, to me, that even brings in the play of the role of the PC, right? It was the HPZ IPC event, and they had a number of security vendors there showing all the threat mitigation you can do on the local PC instead of having to go to the cloud back, right? So you think about the distributed nature of security, cloud network, right, and, um, uh, you know, endpoint. Uh, endpoint is going to play a much bigger role here. But all of that has to work together. But just because you find a breach on an endpoint, doesn't necessarily mean that's where it emanated from, right? So, yeah. um, you know, I, I think if the ecosystem doesn't work together, it leaves these big gaps, and that's how companies get breached and how threats move laterally. And that's how yeah. you know customers are in humans on this planet are very negatively impacted by this. Whether it's everything from a flight delay to not having your medical records available when you need them because you're about to go into surgery. I mean, it's it touches every aspect of our lives. It does, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, more than most people I think realize. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and I think and I think that's actually why the event of two weeks ago was such a moment because I mean I've got friends in the U.S. Army, for example, who were bricked as a result, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, our government came, like the military is inoperable yeah. right now, and yeah. I mean it makes sense, you know, yeah. obviously when you think about it, but but it is interesting from a systemic perspective just how vulnerable we as not just companies as a society are. And I think that's why our conversations this week are so relevant and so interesting. I'm having a little more fun than I expected yeah. this week. I'm not going to lie. I, and I think yeah, it's the great. data that I saw was the number of affected computers was 8% of the Microsoft overall base, right? So that was just 8%, yeah. right? It's, 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 you know, got yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, and it, yeah. yeah I mean, you can, only, you can only imagine. Wow. Yeah, I don't know what it was It worth. seemed massive, but it was 8%. 
Yeah. Right. Well, everyone who was impacted was talking. Yeah. So it becomes a pretty big share of voice yeah. moment when 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 you have chaos like that. What a what an awesome week, guys. Yeah. I know. This has just been a great week. It's, it's always a blast to have you on the show. I feel oh, like our segments always here. fly yeah. by. <laughs> we, you're, you're a wonderful perspective to have, and, and I look forward to continuing to have fun with you. Always love week. being on the Cube. Yeah. yeah. And John, what a great day. Thanks for bringing and, me out here. And we got tomorrow, too. Big day tomorrow. I know. Big day. Power packed lineup. So many guests. Every segment's booked. It's going to be awesome, folks. And thank all of you for tuning in wherever you might be on this beautiful rock. We're in fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada, here at Black Hat. My name's Savannah Peterson. You're watching the Cube, the leading source for cybersecurity news.